Hi, yep, I'm Ewan and I'm here to talk about production and production instance. Like I said, I'm Ewan and I have worked in technology for quite a while. Um, I started off as a desktop support engineer um, and have variously grown and risen through the ranks as a Linux sysadmin and kind of fell into DevOps. Um, and now I work at the Financial Times where I work on the content team. Um, we're responsible for the back-end APIs that support FT.com. Um, I work a lot with Docker, Kubernetes. Um, we do a lot of programming in Golang. Um, so it's a really, really cool place to work. I really enjoy it. Um, although we are probably best known for our newspaper, um, we're actually almost primarily a digital content company these days. Um, I think it was last year was the first time that our revenue from the website um, and subscriptions from that overtook sort of like the print revenue and from advertising as well. So technology is core to our business. It's really, really important. There's a lot of investment and there's lots and lots of teams across the FT doing various bits of the business. So maybe you're part of a team that's been running for a little while. Um, you're proud of your services that you've built and deployed. Um, but now you've been told that you are now the people in charge of making sure that that keeps running overnight and at weekends, and if it goes down, you're the people who are going to get that phone call. Or maybe you're a new developer or new to technology completely, um, and you've never done this kind of thing before. You're not quite sure what to expect. Um, you've had a bit of time to settle in, perhaps, and get, find your feet. But again, now it's you. You are the person on the spot when things go wrong. How do you cope with that? How would you, it's really, really stressful. I will quite happily tell you right now, I've done it for quite a long time now. But so hands up if you are currently on call or support production systems. So quite a few of you. Um, hands up if you've never done anything like that before or anything like this before. And hands up if you don't like putting your hands up in the middle of conference talks. There we, go. there we go. That's what I was expecting. That's what I was expecting. So I remember what it felt like the first time that I had to go and call and the first time that I got that phone call. Um, it was terrifying, quite frankly. Um, I was asked to fix a system that I knew very little about. Um, I couldn't find any of the documentation. Um, I genuinely thought it was one of the worst things in the world and I was very, very tempted to quit technology entirely and become a llama farmer, just run away and hide and never come back to the office because everyone would be judging me for not being able to fix that thing. So I still feel like that sometimes when I get that call at 2am. I still have that twinge of fear. It's almost something like imposter syndrome. I know I'm probably good enough to fix most things. But no matter how good you are, um, I think everyone has that slight sort of like worry that, can I even fix it? Or what happens if I'm not good enough? Um, so the idea behind this talk was to add some tips and tricks and advice and some suggestions that maybe I could help for new developers or for teams that are now starting to move into that support world. Because with DevOps and with that more sort of like merging of uh, development and support, um, it's becoming more and more common. And not everyone has had that experience or maybe even that training. I'm not sure if there is even necessarily training for sort of like operational support stuff. Perhaps there is, I've not actually looked. Um, so hopefully, once you walk out of this talk, you'll have some ideas and some tips so that you're not dreading that phone call or that Slack message quite so much um, when you go on to uh, that support rotor or the on-call rotor. Um, so this is the first talk that I've ever written, so I'm a little bit nervous. But when I was writing this talk, um, I was told it helps to have a really tenuous theme to link everything together. Um, so I was sat there and I was thinking, so who else is a bit grumpy, like most sysadmins are, and who else get, keeps getting woken up at 2 o'clock in the morning? So Ebenezer Scrooge from A Christmas Carol, I feel, is a very close analogy to uh, most of us who are doing support. And in the same way, it leads on quite nicely onto the flow of things that we can do. There's things that we can plan ahead for, we can set up, and we can get done before incidents happen. There's some basic steps and questions and things we should do when things actually go wrong. Um, and then there's the aftermath. There's things we should do to tidy up and, and make things better for next time. So that leads quite nicely into uh, this. So if you walked out right now and went back to your company, went back to your office, what, could, what can you do? What, could, what should you think about before the next big problem happens? Instant management is like anything else that we do at work. So you can practice it. You can think about it. You can try and get better at it. 
if you start, if the first time that you do this is at that two o'clock morning phone call, when you're blind, you've got no documentation, you've got no plan of action, um, it's not, it's not going to go well. I will spoil, spoiler alert that for you. Um, if you're familiar with dealing with your systems and your alerts, and you've already got some experience running your stuff in production, you're going to feel a lot more comfortable when you're asked to take a look at problems. So get, getting people to rotate through support um, on a regular basis on your teams, um, I feel is a very, very important part of this. Um, at the FT, we call this opt copying. So every week, one developer or a couple of developers will be on the channels and the various bits that when things go wrong, they're the ones who dig into it. And what this lets you do is it gets everyone familiar with what can go wrong, the alerts that go off, um, the monitoring tools that you use, and how to fix stuff as well. Um, it also makes sure that everyone has access to all of your systems, because there's nothing worse than being asked to try and fix something, and then you realise that you don't actually have access to that. We had this the other day when someone couldn't log into Heroku, and trying to fix a problem that you can't access the system it doesn't really work very well. Um, so get rid of rubbish alerts as well. Alert noise is really, really bad. It hides real problems. Um, or inversely, like you might get called out for no reason as well. And that's just as bad. Um, Sarah Wells did a really cool talk on this um, a few years back. I definitely recommend that you check it out. And have a plan for when things do go wrong. Not if things go, go wrong, but they will. So depending where you are and what you're doing, what size company you're at, um, this might be very different for you guys. Uh, sorry, people. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, for the audience. For the audience, yes. Um, so maybe your company is large enough that uh, you have a first line team that would escalate problems to you um, that they're unable to fix. Um, and the, the plan for dealing with incidents might be very well defined, very, very um, structured, and there's a very clear path of what happens. Um, alternatively, if you're in a startup, um, maybe it's just four or five people. Um, and maybe in that situation, you just have a chat with your colleagues and your friends, and you work out who, who should be doing what and what's expected from you. So it really does depend on where you are. Either way, you don't want to be sat there wondering what you're meant to be doing or who's meant to be doing things at that point when things are going wrong. Um, and once you do have guides on what to do and a plan for how to react and how to actually um, fix things once they break, make sure that you actually practice it. Um, fail over, rotate keys, rebuild things from scratch, run through things on a regular basis to make sure that your guides work and that everyone is familiar with what you do. Um, we did this in fairly spectacular fashion one day uh, when we performed, uh, what did I put, an unscheduled test of our disaster recovery procedures. So, uh, yeah, we were provisioning a new production cluster for our, uh, for our back-end APIs, um, and we use Ansible um, for this part of this. Um, so we spun up a new cluster, and we asked for five new instances. Um, when, I don't know how familiar people are with Ansible, but if you're not careful when you write your Ansible playbooks, when you say, give me five instances, sometimes what it will do, if you're not careful, is make sure that you have five instances in total across your production environment. So everything else suddenly evaporated. And the first that we knew of this was when all of our alerts went off. And my friend who was sat next to me just said a very quiet, oh no, in the corner. <laughs> that kind of alerted us to the point where, yeah, maybe something's gone wrong. So was it a problem? Yes, it was a problem. Um, we had a brief outage uh, while we worked out what was going on. Um, but we were back up and running fairly quickly. Um, we'd failed over to our backup cluster. <laughs> I, quite like, I quite like that one. Um, we failed over to our backup cluster. Um, and we'd already had a recovery guide on how to spin everything back up from scratch. And we'd run through this, you know, on a, maybe, maybe not monthly, but on a semi-regular basis. So everyone was familiar with what needed to be done. We definitely wouldn't have wanted to find out that our disaster recovery guide didn't actually work at this point in time. We'd ironed out bugs, we'd ironed out problems several months prior to this point. Um, so yeah, that kind of leads on to the next point quite nicely, which is keeping your documentation up to date. Um, no one really likes documentation, um, but you do need things for when things go wrong and for common fixes and when problems happen. Um, what it does, where it lives, how it works, that's a good starting point. If you have nothing, so maybe, again, if you're in a startup and you have, you're starting from scratch, Maybe think about those three points as your initial ideas. Um, panic guides. So we use panic guides for 
common fixes and commands that we might need to solve things. We give these to our first line operation stuff. Um, they're really important as well. When you're writing those, think about what it's like when it's 2 a.m. and you've just been woken up. Um, so you don't want a huge ream of documentation that you've got to dig through to find the important bits. Keep it short, keep it sweet, keep it to the bits that you need to get things back up and running. Um, and yeah, it's awful trying to fix a system with no documentation, um, especially when the only person who knows anything about it has either left or they're on holiday. Um, one of my previous jobs was at a fairly small development company. We did lots of Java sort of software and uh, that kind of thing. Um, everyone tended to chip in as everyone tended to chip in with various bits of technology, um, as is the case in most small companies. Um, so we had a power cut in the office one day, and it wasn't very long, maybe about five to ten minutes. Um, mostly just hit everyone's desktop, so everyone sort of went, okay, coffee break, came back, power came back on. Um, and strangely, no one's emails were working. Um, as I was in operations at the time, we checked our monitoring, checked our alerts. The email server seems fine. It's all there. It's not got a corrupt disk or corrupt database. Like The UPS has been running perfectly fine throughout this whole thing. We spent quite a while digging into this. And while we've got the CEO getting rather angry, because obviously they can't send any emails, that's quite a big problem for a small business. Um, eventually, we found out that the email relay, email relay for the whole office was actually one of our developers' desktops under his desk, which wasn't on a UPS, and it wasn't documented anywhere, and the entire company depended on this tiny little box that was covered in dust. Um, it took us a while to find it, and then turn it back on, and then find the scripts that were needed and the commands that were needed to actually start the relay back up. So it wasn't great fun. The guy who actually set it up was on holiday when this happened, so the first he knew about it was when he came back, um, and we all sort of got rather tetchy at him for doing this, but yeah. Um, so shadow IT is generally fairly bad. Um, get things documented, get it monitored. If it's important, then make sure that you know how to fix it. And the other side of that as well is break things and then find out what happens. Do the things that you are expecting actually go off? Do they actually break? Um, Chaos Monkey and Chaos Engineering, like they're fairly widely spread, very well-known examples of that. But even doing things in a manual, very, very controlled way as well, if you're less mature in that, so like we don't tend to run Chaos Monkey, but we would like to. Um, but for now, we can still turn things off and double check that what breaks is actually what we expect to happen. Run disaster recovery tests as well, to make sure that you iron out any bugs with your processes. And uh, we at the FT, we used to, or we still have a couple of data centers. We're trying to move out of them at the moment. We're very much cloud first at the moment. Um, but we do still run some physical hardware. And part of what we do is we perform regular uh, failover tests, effectively. We disconnect data centers to um, check what happens effectively. Um, all of our important services, we run in both. So the idea is that you know, if one disappears, then we can fail over or keep it running without too many problems. So one weekend, everyone comes into the office, um, and we give the go-ahead. The network team pull out the network cable from the data center, um, and the ops dashboard lights up with red everywhere, which is great. That's what we were hoping for. If it was all green, then there's clearly a fairly big problem there. Um, OK, so step two, let's get our services back online. So let's fail over to our active data center. Um, that was the point when we realized that our failover system needed both data centers there in order to be able to fail over. So it wasn't really that useful as a failover system. Um, we did then plug everything back in and fix it up fairly quickly. Uh, but if we hadn't done that, then we probably wouldn't have realized that. We probably wouldn't have known about that. And in the event of something actually going wrong, that would have been fairly traumatic for everyone involved, I think. So it's useful to have a place as well, um, such as a chat channel that everyone can join. Um, at the FT, we use this as a channel to communicate uh, potential problems, like maybe someone thinks there might be something wrong, but they're not quite sure, um, and to report changes that are in progress as well. Um, so if people are either deploying releases or performing network maintenance, they pop a message in there. So everyone who's part of that channel can see what's going on. Um, and it helps cut down a bit on, oh, that's weird. What's going on here? Um, oh, it's this release. Like, it makes it a lot easier to communicate. At a previous company, um, nobody accepted bug. Oh, sorry, this is a screenshot of uh, our channel, by the way. Um, but at a previous company that I worked at, nobody accepted bugs or issues without an uh, associated Jira ticket, um, which is important. Tracking stuff, tracking things like that is really important. 
But the Jira form that we used took about 15 minutes to uh, fill out, which led to nobody filling out this Jira form um, because they didn't want to have to spend that much time, that fiddliness, get bounced back with uh, validation errors. Like if you've ever tried doing this, you probably understand the pain involved. Um, so no one reported anything, um, which was great because our bug stats looked awesome. Um, the managers were really happy. But it led to far bigger problems later on. Um, because there were all these things underlying, because no one wanted to spend the effort to report them. Make it easy to report stuff. Have a channel. Just let people type things in. Um, don't make them jump through hoops to inquire if there's issues going on. Um, so, yeah, that's some ideas of things that you could go away right now. I hope you don't. Um, and then get started on before your next major incident. But let's say something's happened. There's alerts have gone off, you've been either called out or you've been asked to investigate. Um, what's the first steps that you should really do? What should you be thinking about when you get that call? Dealing with incidents is really stressful, and I still get very wound up uh, when I'm asked to deal with problems like this as well. Do what you can to remind yourself that it's not the end of the world, um, unless you work at a nuclear power plant, in which case probably be a bit more worried about alerts going off and things like that. But for most of us, if, um, if something goes wrong, the website goes down, or maybe a service fails. It's probably not, in the grand scheme of things, the end, like, it's not the biggest problem ever. So take a step back, take a deep breath, and then think about things logically so you can get things fixed. Don't dive straight in either. It's really, really tempting, and I still do this. I still have to try and remind myself to um, step back and think about things. Um, to jump in and try, and try, try to solve the problem straight away. Go back to basics first. Um, treat it the same as anything else that you would do at work or anywhere, really. Um, get as much information as possible uh, before you start. Um, some, it's often in technology that the problems aren't always immediately obvious, and Diving straight in can often lead, lead you on the wrong path as a red herring, perhaps. And generally speaking, no, no matter what the problem is, there's always a certain set of questions that I'll be asking myself before digging into a problem further. And the first one of those is, what's the actual impact of this alert or call-out or problem? Um, at the FT, for example, like I said, we're a content company. Our most important sort of like business flows are can we publish content? Can editorial get the news out? And can customers access the website? So can they actually get the news? Um, and probably can they pay us as well? That's probably quite another big one. Um, a problem preventing something like that, if there's a breaking news event and we can't publish, that's really, really bad. So we will always jump on that, no matter when it is or what time it is, and we'll immediately pull everyone in that we can to solve that problem. If I get called out saying that my Jenkins box is running out of disk space on a Saturday night, I'm probably not going to worry too much, and I'll probably just leave that until Monday morning. So, some things to consider. Is it affecting your customers? Is it affecting your business? Is it critical? And is the system block blocking other things as well, right now? Because if it's overnight, and it doesn't need to be fixed immediately, it can often be better to actually wait until there's more eyes on the problem rather than trying to rush production fixes in, which may actually cause more damage later on. Um, let's assume that it's an important system and it needs looking at right now. So what's already been tried? Maybe nothing if you're the first responder. Um, maybe it's the first time that you've already Maybe first line, even. I haven't read my notes properly. Maybe they've already run through the uh, run books and the obvious solutions. They've checked, the, uh, they've checked the servers and things like that. Or maybe your teammates have tried some fixes as well. Um, get as much information as possible, because getting vague details um, really doesn't help when trying to diagnose issues. When people say to me, it's like, OK, I've, I've restarted it. Like, what's it? Is it, what, the website? your laptop, your Wi-Fi router, the data center, like we don't know. So get as much detail as possible from anyone that you're communicating with who's tried things already. Um, and other times as well, you'll have reports of the website is slow. What does that actually mean? What's, how is that presenting itself? Because that could mean anything from, okay, like there's a DDoS on Dyn again, and 90% of the internet is down, and ft.com isn't working as well probably can't do much about fixing that. Or it might mean someone's home Wi-Fi router is broken, but they're reporting a problem. Um, or it might mean the website is actually slow, in which case, yeah, we will dive onto that straight away. 
Perhaps the monitoring is actually broken. It started spamming out alerts to everyone on the mailing list and everyone in every Slack channel. We've had that happen before, and it's obviously quite intimidating when you come in to see a huge list of alerts. But get as much information as you can and validate there is actually a problem. Double check, because people do report stuff and it's actually not anything to do with your systems. That's happened so many times. I'm sure people have had that. Um, so yeah, and depending on what you're doing as well, depending on what your service is, um, getting back online is often much more important than actually fixing the root cause. If you can fail over, if you can roll back a release, if you can restore a database snapshot, if you can do something that doesn't necessarily fix the underlying cause but gets you back up and running in the meantime so you can spend more time digging into the problem deeper, try and do that first, if you can. That's not always possible, obviously. Um, and this will entirely depend on your system and your architecture and the uh, nature of your issues. But good, good starting point for me um, as a Linux sysadmin um, is a disk full, is it running out of memory, CPU, is a network overloaded, all that kind of stuff. Do the basics first. Um, have you checked the logs? Like, that's what I always forget to do. I probably shouldn't be admitting that on stage. That probably doesn't uh, sort of bode well, but I'm sure other people in the audience have gone, oh yeah, I wish I'd looked at the logs earlier. A few chuckles, okay, good, right. Um, have you checked the steps in your panic guide? Um, and you did have documentation, right, because that's what we talked about before. Um, has there been a new release, deployment? Has there been other work going on in your systems at the same time? Um, maybe the network team have been doing firewall releases or perhaps like the database team have been doing some storage work. That happens quite a lot. See if you could, this, this is where the common channel comes in handy for seeing what other people are doing that might affect you. And are there other known issues or outages happening as well? Um, so the example that I had before was the great Dynepocalypse of 2016. Um, or when we've had problems with AWS, with S3 going down, or EC2. Um, all of those are things that are almost certainly affecting our systems, but I might not be able to actually fix by changing our system. So make sure you look outside your little bubble as well. Um, so let's assume that whatever's gone wrong isn't that simple to solve, and we can't just fail over, we can't just restore. You've done your investigation, you've tried the obvious solutions, and you're still stuck. Everything is still broken. Don't be afraid to call for help. Call for backup if you can. I'm assuming that most people here, um, and I might be wrong, um, probably work at companies where you're part of a team or you've got colleagues that you can call on for help and call for support. Um, sometimes it's better to bring other people in early um, and get help quickly rather than spending too long investigating a problem and then just delaying. If you know that you can't fix it and you're really, really stuck, don't be afraid just to put your hand up and go, people, I need, I need a hand here. Um, nobody will think less of you. So we had an air conditioning alert. At, uh, this is another company that I worked at. Um, an air conditioning alert for our office server room. Uh, and it went off at the weekend. Um, one of the tech directors got the text alert for some reason. I'm not quite sure why he was on the mailing list, but he was. Um, so he thought, OK, brilliant. I will go into the office. I will go into the comms room. I will turn the air con back on to make sure that none of the servers crash. Um, and he couldn't remember the code. Uh, so the natural solution to this was to crawl through the four ceiling. I'm sure you've got some four ceilings in the office. Um, to crawl through there and try and get into the server room. The ceiling gave way. Uh, he then fell into the comms room and kind of onto a lar rather large stack of servers, um, which then obviously caused even more problems for us to try and resolve on uh, Monday morning. Wild servers are easily startled. This is my uh, quote as a sysadmin. Uh, they don't like breathing in several years of ceiling dust either, so if you've got some at home, just bear that in mind. Um, and they definitely don't like people falling on them either. So. I, it didn't look like that at all. Um, I appreciate that he was trying to make sure that he didn't call us out, uh, which is a nice, it's a nice thought. Um, but I think, all in all, we would all have preferred if he had just called us up and asked what the code was so that we could have just fixed the problem uh, rather than replacing the ceiling. That wasn't, that wasn't fun. <laughs> I've done lots of different jobs in my years of technology. Um, so, yeah, communication is key. Um, you can probably ask TSB about this one. Um, it's pretty irritating if you get alerts or problems, or as a customer, if you're trying to log in or do something um, and you can't access your login or you can't access your account um, and there's no communication from companies whatsoever 
or even within a company, if you depend on another team's service, um, you spend several hours debugging your system, you're looking at all your stuff, and you go, right, I've narrowed it down, it's a problem with this other system by this team. And you let them know, and they go, yeah, it's been down all day, we're looking at it. It's like, why didn't you tell us? Why didn't you tell everyone so that we didn't waste that time? Communicate as much as possible. Um, and even though everything is on fire, you will still need to communicate with the customers and other parts of the business as well. That's really, really difficult. Multitasking is really, really hard. Um, I'm struggling to click and talk at the same time. Um, when you're trying to actually fix the problem, you don't want to be sat there responding to emails, dealing with Slack messages, um, having C-level XX tapping you on the shoulder going, is it fixed yet? Is it fixed yet? Put someone in charge. Make them responsible for instant coordination, management, and communication as well. It's much easier having a central person who can insulate the team who are trying to actually fix the problem um, from the wider sort of like comms questions and ETAs and that kind of thing. Um, it prevents interruptions and you know what it's like when you're in the zone, you're debugging a problem or writing some code and someone just taps you on the shoulder and that's it, it's gone. Like that's 10 minutes, disappeared. Provide regular updates. Make sure everyone knows what's going on, what the status is. Is it don't overpromise, obviously, but if you're still looking at it, just let people know, say, every half an hour, for example. Maybe not, maybe longer. It depends on your company or your team. And if you're like us and you have alerts and notifications in your chat channels, um, when things do go wrong, it probably looks something like that, and you just see the stream of alerts coming past, which makes the channel completely unusable. Um, maybe that's just us, I don't know. But it really helps to have a separate channel uh, or a separate group for dealing with that instance specifically. Um, it's especially true if you have people across the business or from multiple teams who all need to coordinate um, on fixing a single problem. Because we work with fairly complex distributed systems, um, most of us, I'd imagine. Um, it's not always as simple as it's that. It's often it's that because this happened and then it's this over here which then had a knock-on over there. And then you have to pull in four teams to try and fix the actual issue that's going on. It also helps a lot when it comes to writing incident reports and things later on for having a timeline. Um, you can go back and see exactly who's doing what, when, um, and have it all time stamped as well, which is really, really valuable. If you've ever been trying to fix things with multiple people, um, it looks a lot like this. Um, and this is probably my uh, personal handbook as a sysadmin. Um, having a central place, a, a central place to communicate really helps with coordination. Um, making sure people put down what they are doing, what they are trying, what they're releasing. Um, the last thing you want is, okay, I've just applied this change to try and fix the system. Someone else goes, oh, I just rolled that back. I was trying something else. Is you just end up with people conflicting. Make sure everyone communicates what they're doing, so that you can both, you can all work to like the common goal of fixing stuff. Um, and for example, as an engineer trying to fix the problem, this is uh, an example of one of our instant channels from a little while ago. Um, we'll be discussing the problems, sharing logs and graphs, uh, announcing changes or tweaks or fi attempted fixes. Um, it really helps having a separate place that's quieter effectively, so you don't have other people jumping in and posting and trying to cross-communicate with you. You've got your own separate place. And I've mentioned this already, communication, but it is so important when it comes to instance. Providing external updates, um, like I said, maybe every half an hour or an hour or whatever you feel is the appropriate time, but don't leave people hanging. There's nothing worse than someone going, OK, I'm looking into it, and then you get radio silence. And no one knows, is it fixed? Is it still broken? Are they trying? Have they gone to lunch? No one quite knows. So provide updates if it's an important problem. And. When you are tired and stressed, which you will be if you are dealing with a production incident that has run on for quite a long time, you will make mistakes. People don't work very well in that kind of situation. Um, make sure that people take breaks, uh, even if the problem is still ongoing. It's really, really hard to, and I, I find this, it's really hard to tear myself away and go, it's still broken, but I need 15 minutes to go and get a coffee or go for a smoke or take a walk. I, will, I have sat there and carried on and tried to struggle through because the rest of my team are doing it, so I shouldn't really leave and disappear, should I? But that's how we make mistakes. It's, we're less effective, we miss obvious things, and potentially we even make things worse because we're not thinking properly. 
Um, so for long running instance, make sure that you have people regularly take breaks. And for very large companies like global ones um, or very long running instance, that might even be handing it over to another team. That might be uh, writing everything up and then passing it on to the next department who will cover this and then run through with it to completion. Um, if you're a small startup, it probably isn't, but you definitely need to make sure people at least take breaks and uh, clear their head. Um, so our longest running instant that I've been part of at the FT anyway, um, our production clusters started deteriorating due to sort of like heavy load on probably around sort of like 6 p.m. on a Friday. So that gives you an idea of how much everyone wanted to be at the office. Um, just as about everyone's about to leave for the pub um, and sort of go home back to their lovely lives at the weekend. Um, so the alerts go off, we see load increase, we see nodes start dropping out of our clusters, we see service, services start failing. Um, we haven't had any increase in traffic, so it's not that we're getting, I don't know, DDoS, it's not that we are suddenly published a news article that the entire world wants to read for some reason. Um, we can't work out what's going on. We're really, really puzzled. There's no, we haven't got an obvious cause of what triggered this. Um, given that our backup cluster over in the United States is healthy, um, we fail traffic over to the US. Um, and then the US starts presenting the same problems as well. So we know it's traffic. We do know it's traffic. It's something that we're doing, but we don't know what. We then spend several hours trying to fix the problem, trying to diagnose the issues, digging deep into the sort of insides of our clusters. And by this point, lots, well, quite a few people have, who were nearby, in, nearby the office have actually come back to the office to help out, or they've logged on from home because we've asked for help. Um, none of us can work it out. As an engineer, that is the most terrifying <laughs> feeling ever when everyone is sat there and just goes, ah. Eventually, it takes our director of engineering, who jumps on as well, I mean, this is how much it kind of escalated, um, to suggest that maybe we route traffic through our staging environment. Um, and then we manually edit our varnish configurations on our production boxes, um, providing some routing and S um, TLS. Um, and we actually route this all the way back through to our old legacy platform, which we are migrating off. But fortunately, we hadn't actually decommissioned yet, because if we had, that would have been, well, that wouldn't have even been an option. Um, I think it's around, I can't see what it says there, but it's probably around 11.30 uh, before we get to a point where we're serving stable traffic and it is in a really janky way. Like the, the, the flow diagram for this is all over the place. We all went home. We had to go home. We were completely fried. We, there's no way we could have carried on trying to work out what the actual cause of the problem was. So we're serving traffic. That's good enough for us. Let's go home and we can log on tomorrow and take a look. Eventually, we've, we identified the root cause the next day um, as an update to a database query that made it extremely slow, but in a very delayed fashion. Um, so that, hence why we didn't see an immediate change that caused these problems. But that happened, we, are, we, we found this problem at around 4.30 the next day. If we, had, if we had just spent all the time trying to fix it or identify the cause, that's a really long outage. Um, as it was, we ended up, yeah, we ended up serving... Um, we ended up serving stale content to the front page, to ft.com. Um, but they're rather good. It failed gracefully, um, even though the back-end APIs were really unreliable. Um, and there was actually zero end-user downtime. For any, any of our customers, um, they wouldn't have seen anything. They may not have got any breaking news updates, and fortunately, there wasn't anything dramatic going on at that time. Um, but it all worked out in the end, and we, we learned a lot of lessons from that. So, what do you need to do once the dust has settled and you're back online, you've, fi you've got online anyway? Take, take some time. Take some time out for your own mental health because it's really, really stressful dealing with this. And like I said, it's, it's not conducive to doing good work or effective work. If you need to take the morning off, obviously I'm not your manager, I can't tell you to do this, but I would strongly recommend that anyone who's been dealing with problems overnight or anyone who's been in the office late for trying to solve issues like this um, takes a little bit of time just to recover and relax a little bit. Um, make sure you run post-mortems or instant reviews, especially if it had a serious impact or, or had multiple teams or people involved. The objective, I mean, I think this is probably talked about quite a lot, but the objective isn't to point fingers and assign blame to people, um, but it is a good place to discuss what worked in your response and your fix. Um, what didn't and what can be improved for next time. And that last bit is the really important bit. What can be improved for next time? 
Do it quickly after the instant because if you leave it too long, everyone will inevitably forget things. Um, and then you're sat there going, oh, did you do that? You did that, and then, oh, who, it was, I uh, can't quite remember. Do it quickly so it's still fresh in everyone's minds. And this is where keeping a timeline comes in handy as well, when I was talking about having a separate channel for logging what people are doing. Write up, writing up instant reports is really important, um, depending where you are and what you're doing. Um, they may be enforced, required, and very, very formal. Um, and you may need to make them public, or you may need to share them with external customers, perhaps. Um, and even if you don't, they are really, really valuable for within your team or within the company, um, so that you have a record of previous failures that you can refer back to later. Um, there's nothing worse than running into problems again, where you go, oh, it's exactly like what happened last year. And then everyone scratches their heads a bit and tries to remember what happened last year and how it was fixed. Um, yeah, so if you've ever, if you've ever had um, people not document what's going on. We've had conversations like that in our teams before. Um, so yeah, make sure you write up what happened. And they're quite handy for writing talks like this as well, because I can look back and remember what went on. Um, we find the most value at the FT in identifying follow-up actions. Um, what could have prevented the problem in the first place? Um, what can be fixed or improved? Um, whether that might be code or infrastructure or bug fixes, um, or whether that's actually the process and procedure of how we responded and how we um, actually jumped in and fixed the problem. There's a lot of scope for things that can be improved. It's not just code. Um, make sure they get done as well. Like, don't just leave them behind and then forget about them. And this is quite a good example of an instant report. Um, I don't use... Travis CI. Um, I don't have anything against them. I just liked the instant report. So don't take this as a judgment of them or as a service. I don't know if anyone hears from Travis, but um, I just liked the instant report. They had a, I think it was a developer, had an environment variable in an old terminal that was set pointing to the production database. So when he then, then ran some tests, it dropped the entirety of production, which, you know, we hear about this. It's probably happened to quite a few of us in this room before. I've definitely done it. Um, but the outage then turned into a bit more of a security incident because people who were still logging in then got other people's user IDs, which meant they got all their account details and their customer billing data and their every PII thing that was there, which is obviously not great. Um, fortunately, GDPR wasn't in play for them yet. But the instant report itself is quite good. It clearly lays out what happened and then what the fix was, what they did to resolve it, and remediation steps, improvements for next time. A clear list of things that they have done or will do in future to make sure that this problem cannot happen again. Um, they've removed truncate permissions, for example, and uh, added warnings if you're connected to production, which I think is reasonable. And this can encompass multiple things. It might be improvements to your instant process, um, because your process, especially if you're setting this up for the first time, um, it's not going to be perfect when you start out. You're going to have missed things. You're going to find that, actually, this doesn't work as well as we thought it would. Um, we should change it and improve it. And that's fine. That's what we're used to. We iterate. We improve. We adapt. Um, maybe the documentation was incomplete and needs to be updated. All these things, make sure they get done. Um, because otherwise, if you have the same problem a week later or a month later, you don't want to be in that situation again. And we had, a, we had an outage at uh, another company that I worked at once, uh, where a business analyst, very similar to what Travis CI had, uh, ran scripts against production, um, thinking they were connected to pre-production. Um, it does happen a lot. I don't, uh, this always seems to be a problem that you just run into so many times. Um, the main reason that I mentioned this one um, was that the prod database was named prod, which is fairly standard, I think. The pre-prod database was named pprod. I didn't name it. It wasn't me, honest. Um, and top of our list of actions was rename the database, please, very quickly. And don't name it pprod in future. Like, who does that? Um, and we also restricted access to production databases because for people who don't need it, why let them have access? So those, yes, it's a fairly bad incident, but you learn and then you improve. Um, and that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover in the talk. I hope you found it interesting and useful. Um, and to sum up briefly, instants and issues are just another part of what we deal with day to day in technology. 
Um, it's how we plan for them, it's how we respond to them, it's how we act on them, and then improve things afterwards that really makes the difference between good response and bad response. And for those of you that are new to sort of like supporting things, I hope I've not completely scared you off entirely. Hopefully you've got some ideas of things that you can go away and do after this to make your lives easier and more comfortable when things inevitably do break. Um, and if you need to go on call, then uh, you'll have some plans in place to cope with this, so you're not going to be completely blind when it happens. Thank you very much. That is everything I have to do.